Please just bow our heads and let's just pray that the Holy Spirit would minister to us as we receive his word. Please bow your heads. Lord, we just want to say thank you for another day, even for snow. Oh God, we want to say thank you. Thank you for the fact that everyone who's gone here has gone here safe and sound and there's been no injury. Lord, we want to say thank you for everything. And right now, Lord, as we receive your word, I'm asking, Father, that please you would help us all to have hearts that receive your word. Lord, a life that does and, and practices your word and obeys you and demonstrates our love for you in that way. Holy Spirit, would you please give us understanding to understand your word so that we may pro properly apply it. And as we properly apply it, Lord, you receive all the glory and let the joy be ours, please, Lord. In Jesus Christ's holy and anointed name we pray. Amen. Please be seated, everyone. Please be seated. I'm quite giddy today. I don't know why. But I thank God for the joy of the Lord. So as we were talking over the last couple of weeks, we dealt with the introduction to the spiritual realm. Okay? Introduction to the spiritual realm. And one of the main things that we really tried to hammer in last week and the week before was the fact that scripture is written by God. Everyone say, scripture is written by God. One more, say, it is, one more time, say, scripture is written by God. You can only properly know God through scripture, as the Holy Spirit helps us and illuminates our minds and our hearts to understand. Now, for those who might want to say, well, I don't really want to believe in scripture. Well, there's only one recorded person who ever rose from the grave. When you look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the most valid theory or the most practical or probable theory is that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead or that he rose from the grave. What we know is that his tomb is empty and his tomb was empty. It's recorded in history as being so. Some people who don't believe want to say things like, well, the disciples stole his body. But we know that the disciples were afraid. They were petrified. None of them were willing to come out and say that they were disciples. That's why Peter denied Christ three times before the rooster crowed. So they were too scared to challenge Rome. Why would they then fight two centurions and then steal the body of Jesus Christ? So we know that can't be it. Other people tried to say, well, Jesus Christ didn't actually die. He was just knocked unconscious. And that when he regained consciousness again, he then pushed the stone away and then he left the tomb. Well, that doesn't make sense either because the stone was so heavy that as recorded in human history, if I'm not mistaken, it took about six men to roll the stone. How could one man who was bludgeoned to death, suffocated to death, just recover and move the stone away by himself? It's not possible. Outside of that, the theories become really, really weird, like aliens came and stole his body away. Now, that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So the most probable or plausible theory for the tomb being empty is that Jesus Christ actually resurrected. Especially with the fact that Peter and the remaining disciples went suddenly from being petrified of death to suddenly being willing to die for this person. Not only did you have the disciples, the 12 disciples, but you also had 500 eyewitnesses who testified that they saw the risen Lord. Some people say it was hallucination. If it was hallucination, only one or two people may see it. But 500 at the same time? It doesn't make much sense. So I'm going to believe the guy who rose from the grave. And the guy who rose from the grave testified that the Old Testament was worthy to be believed. Second, he said that when you receive his disciples, you receive him. So he's testifying that the New Testament is worthy to be believed. So Jesus has verified both the Old and the New Testament. So because Jesus Christ, this man who rose from the grave, the only one in history to ever do it, because he testified to the veracity of scripture, we choose to believe scripture. Everyone say we choose to believe scripture. And so when it comes to the spiritual realm, we're not going to first and foremost deal with what people have experienced. Those, those things can help to enlighten or those things can help to, to add or, or beautify, well not further beautify, but add to what we have said. But really we want to go for our doctrine to the word of God. That's where we get all our doctrine from, the word of God. So when it comes to the spiritual realm, we're going to look at what scripture has to say and what we're starting with is God. Everyone say God. So if you want a title for today's sermon, the title is A Spiritual God. Last week, the last two weeks were introduction to the spiritual realm. Today's title is A Spiritual God. Okay, that's why we got to read from John chapter 4. And the key verse was really verse, uh, let's see, verse 24. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, why are we teaching about God? For some of you, you'll feel that what we talk about today is very basic. Oh, I know this. Why are we talking about this? But we are teaching you about God, okay, 
even though, by the way, I want you to note that of all the things we're going to say today, we will not be able to exhaust the reaches of the depths of the wisdom and knowledge of God. We will not be able to exhaust it. So we're only going to, by God's grace, try our best to say as much as we possibly can. But understand that it's going to take all of eternity to study and know God. It will take all of eternity to know him completely. But God's grace tells us in scripture that we will know in full then. But we are learning about God so that we can know him. Everyone say, so you can know him. So that you can know what he is and what he isn't. And thirdly, so that you can know who he is and who he isn't. This is very necessary for us. I'll tell you guys a quick anecdote. There was a Jehovah's Witness who used to work at my former place of work. And I used to speak to him because Jehovah's Witness, they, some of them intimidate other people because they talk as though they know the scriptures when in actuality what they have are actually scriptures removed from scripture. They've got Bible verses removed from scripture and other things added in. Okay? So, I said, you know what? Let me speak to this Jehovah's Witness. What is it that you actually believe? Let's talk, shall we? And on speaking with him, one of the things that he said was that the Holy Spirit is not a person. The Holy Spirit is a force. I.e., the Holy Spirit is not a he, the Holy Spirit is an it. Now, on listening to that, I was like, well, no, no, no. But let me tell you what started to happen emotionally to me over the next few weeks. I started to struggle to identify with the Holy Spirit as a person. I started actually feeling like maybe this guy is right. Maybe the Holy Spirit is an it, just a force, God's active agent or force working on earth. But understand this, what I may have felt was wrong because it didn't line up with scripture. It is scripture that testifies that the Holy Spirit is a person. So understand, I'm telling you these things because what we feel must conform to what we know and who we know. If there's something you want to write down, that's one of the things to write down. What we feel must conform to what we know and who we know. Is this making sense? What we feel must conform to what we know and who we know. Don't ever feel that just because you feel something is right, that it actually is. The arbiter of what is right and what is true is God, and he speaks primarily through his word. So we must know him through the word by the Holy Spirit and sound doctrine. The Holy Spirit teaches us sound doctrine. And I say the Holy Spirit and sound doctrine because there are such thing, or there is a such thing as the doctrines of men. Things that human beings teach that God didn't teach, that God didn't say. Okay, and we see this in other religions and in some sects of Christianity. Okay, now back to the focus of what we were talking about. So hopefully it makes sense why we're talking about God today. Why we're teaching on God. God is spirit. Everyone say God is spirit. That's verse 24 of John chapter 4. What does God is spirit mean? What does that actually mean? We saw over the last two weeks that the word spirit in Greek is the word pneuma. Everyone say pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A, I think that's how it's spelled. Pneuma. And that just means beyond the physical, non-carnal. God is spirit. What does that mean? God is beyond the physical. Okay? God is beyond the physical. Now let's see some practical applications of that. If God is beyond the physical, that means that God is not a piece of wood. Many of us know this. Some people don't. Tell your friends. God is not a piece of wood. God is not mother nature. God is not the universe. God is not the earth. God goes beyond the physical. Is this making sense? It also means that God is not invented by human minds. Because our human minds, to a degree, there's a physical element, to a degree. It governs our body. God is not invented by human minds. Why am I telling you this? Because you may have some atheists who say, well, just about 10 million years ago, God, human beings, invented this idea of higher powers and gods. And so now we invented it as a coping mechanism because we were all suffering from an existential crisis. Why do I exist? Therefore, we created God in order to give us purpose, give us reason. No, God is not physical. God is spirit. It also means that God is not just a metaphor. To help us understand the world. God is not just some sort of archetype. As a certain psychologist may try to allude to or it may seem like he's saying. God is not merely an archetype. 
The word of God is not an archetype. When it says the word became flesh, he actually became flesh. God is beyond the physical. He is spirit. He is not invented by human minds. Now, the fact that God is spirit has implications, okay? Because God is spirit, it means that the worship and devotion that God wants also goes beyond the physical. I'll say it again. God is beyond the physical. God is beyond, larger, greater, behind. He is beyond the physical. What that means is the way he wants to be worshipped also goes beyond the physical. When we come to church and we sing, when we come to church and we give offering, when we come to church and we pray, these things are not merely physical things. Tell your neighbor it's not merely physical. It's not just dropping one pound into the basket. It's not physical. God, here, take that, fine. That's just what we do. You might hear some people explain that to unbelievers. Well, why do you do this? Yeah, well, it's just religion. It's just tradition. It's just what we do. No, it is not merely physical. God, the kind of worship he wants goes beyond the physical, okay? Now, what that means, what it means for the kind of worship God wants to go beyond the physical, that does not mean you stay in your room and you go, hum, I'm just waiting for God to download this in my head. Hum, that's not what that means. It doesn't mean you sit down akimbo doing nothing. What God wants your worship to go beyond the physical means is that it is not just mere external regulation. It's not just, I don't swear. It's not just, I don't cuss, I don't lie, I don't cheat, I don't steal. I pay my tithes, I pay my offerings. It's not just that. It's not just external regulation. It's not just, I wear, I cover my head in church. Or, I don't have any tattoos. It's not just that. It goes beyond that. It's not just following a bunch of rules. What it means that God is spirit and those who worship him in spirit and in truth is that we must worship him from the heart. We must worship him from the heart. There are some of us growing up, and even in our teenage years, we just come to church and sit and just let time waste away. We just buy time until it's time to go home and we can play PS4 or PS5 if your girlfriend blessed you with that one. Apparently that's the thing that's happening too. It's not just coming to church and biding time. No. He wants our worship to come from the heart. We don't just sing, and I can't wait till the singing is finished so I can actually hear the word. No, you worship God from the heart. And also, by the way, just so you know, worship isn't just singing. This, what we're doing right now, this is worship. For you to sit down with hearts ready to hear the word of God, that is worship. When you drop offering into the offering basket, that is worship. Every part of the service, and every part, not just of the service, but of our actual lives, should be worship. That's why scripture says, do everything you do for the glory of God. It also means that we don't just circumcise our male babies because that's our regulation. That's what we do. It goes beyond circumcision. Everyone say it goes beyond circumcision. Got some people grinning to themselves. Don't ask your neighbor if they're circumcised. That's none of your business. Philippians chapter 3 verse 3. It says that the true circumcision are those who are circumcised of heart, that that worship God in spirit. It is not just physical. It goes beyond the physical. It's spiritual. Now we need to be careful that we don't over-spiritualize. We need to be careful that we don't over-spiritualize. Because what we might then say is we might go into the heresy of the idea that God doesn't care about the physical at all. It's just about being spiritual. It's not about being physical. Forget the physical. The physical doesn't matter. It's all going to burn up anyway. It's just about being spiritual. Therefore, I'll have nothing to do with the physical. Listen. The physical and the metaphysical are linked. Remember, we said that over the last couple of weeks. That the physical and the metaphysical are linked. Remember, metaphysical just means beyond or behind the physical. So that which happens in the physical is being influenced by the spiritual. The spiritual is the agent or the, the, pa- the powers behind the physical manifesting what we are seeing in the physical. Is this making sense to somebody? Is this making sense? Be verbal. Come on. Is this making sense? Okay. So it's not just we're going to be metaphysical, forget the physical. No. Physical and metaphysical are linked. Okay. Remember we said people can contact the spiritual realm. We know of people who are worshipping idols, really what they're worshipping are demons. We spoke about pharmakia, the witchcraft that is coming from the usage of drugs. We spoke, we've spoken about the fact that some people uh, take strains of weed that allow them to actually start seeing things. Okay? 
We've also spoken about the fact that when we pray, which may seem like just a physical thing, we're actually talking to somebody we cannot see. We're talking to the Father. The Holy Spirit inspires our heart. He reminds us of what Jesus Christ has told us. So we see that God is not just merely about the spiritual and the physical doesn't matter. No, it starts from the spiritual. Remember, what we manifest in the physical needs to come from the spiritual. It needs to not just be regulation. I also want you to remember that God's kingdom, Lord, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. God's kingdom, God's kingdom. Everyone say God's kingdom. God's kingdom isn't just spiritual. It is foundationally spiritual, but it isn't just spiritual. What do I mean? We are God's kingdom here. God's kingdom is ruling here. I mean, you would probably expect it. The name of this church is Kingdom Wisdom and Power Ministries. I mean, you would probably expect it. But God's kingdom is ruling here. We are part of God's kingdom. In a manner of, ske- of speaking, in a manner of speaking, God's kingdom has been made manifest amongst us. We are ambassadors of the kingdom of God, representatives of God's kingdom. But what we also see is that we are awaiting the physical manifestation of the kingdom of God. The new Jerusalem. Some of us think that when we die, we go to heaven and it stops there. No. When we die, we are present with the Lord. After that, there is a time coming where he will return to earth. He will reign for a thousand years. In my view, that is a literal 1,000 years, a millennial kingdom. After that, the Satan will be released for a little time to deceive the nations. God is going to destroy Satan, cast him into the lake of fire. Then you have the white throne judgment. The white throne judgment will happen. And then after that, in the white throne judgment, what you see is that heaven and earth pass away. They pass away. They're gone. But then what you see after that is that God will create a new heaven and a new earth. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And he will reign with his people in the new Jerusalem forever. That will be a spiritual kingdom made manifest in the physical. Is this making sense? So when we're saying God is spirit, try and understand the link between the spiritual and the physical. We use our physical bodies to worship him, but our physical bodies worshiping him is coming from a spirit that submits, adores, and worships him. Does this make sense? Is this making sense? Okay, so understand also in this world, God has physically demonstrated his spiritual goodness and power. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. For God's invisible qualities have been made expressed. They've been made visible, obvious in what we can see in creation. Is this making sense to somebody? So we see that the fact that God is spirit does not mean that he is merely transcendent. God is also imminent. Is this making sense? Okay, good good are you enjoying yourself (laughs) praise the lord okay so i now want to switch it to you guys we are children of god where we're going from here is to talk about we being spiritual people but today we're talking about the spiritual god but i just for a second want to switch it to you guys to us here just as god has made his spiritual goodness expressed to all of mankind through the common graces of a loving family or loving friends or even social media or entertainment, laughter, comedians. God has made his goodness expressed in the good things that every human being gets to enjoy. My question for you has, is, have you made your spiritual reality manifest in the physical? What do I mean? What is your spiritual reality? You have been saved, bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. You are no longer children of wrath. You are royalty. Everyone say royalty. And I don't mean, yes, queen, yes. That's not what I mean. I mean the fact that you are now sons and daughters of God. That ought to have you carry some presence. You've got to carry some presence when you realize that you are sons and daughters of God. And the presence you carry is the Holy Spirit. Do you make manifest this spiritual reality that God has loved you and that he sent his son to die for you? Now you don't go to hell. You get to go to heaven. Do you make that spiritual, spiritual reality physically manifest? Do you do it? Or do you speak like those who have no hope? Do you walk like those who have no hope? Do you talk like those who have no hope? Do you think like those who have no hope? These are the people who are anxious over many little things. Do you make your spiritual reality manifest in the physical? Do you make it known through your behavior? Are you being like God? You are children of God. So do you demonstrate physically your spiritual reality by bearing the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Are you bearing the fruits of the Holy Spirit? That's how we know the Holy Spirit is in you. 
Not by speaking in tongues do we know that the Spirit of God is in someone. But by them living in step with the Holy Spirit. Is this making sense for somebody? Wonderful. Wonderful. So please, don't think that the physical is totally worthless to God. It isn't. It isn't. But first emphasis is on the spiritual. We, wear, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers and demons and principalities and etc., etc. in high places. Okay? The physical does matter to God, but first emphasis is on the spiritual. So as we said, getting back to what we were saying, it's not just about external regulation as far as God is concerned. It's about worshipping from the heart. Now, in John chapter 4, verse 24, it says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. This is the tough part. Sometimes we hear that statement being thrown around a lot. Everyone say, a lot. And people don't really explain, or sometimes we fail to see an explanation of what that really means. It just sounds like some spiritual statement. It's like, hey, don't just stand there. You have to worship him in spirit and in truth. No, it's not enough for you to just jump around. You have to worship him in spirit and in truth. What does it actually mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? What does that actually mean? Is it just some spiritual platitude? No, it actually has meaning. And the things of the spirit, I want you all to pay attention. The things of the spirit do have meaning. Sometimes we attribute meaningless to the Holy Spirit. Oh, well, this is illogical. Oh, yeah, well, that's God. You just can't understand him. What? Who told you you can't understand God? Yes, there are some things that he will keep from your understanding. True. But everything we need for life and godliness and righteousness and all those lovely things, he has revealed. And he's revealed them because they're meant to be understood. So please don't think about the spiritual as some enigmatic, ethereal thing that can never be understood. No, they can be understood. It just takes the Holy Spirit to understand these things. So we're going to look at what this statement means, spirit and in truth. This is what it means. First of all, the nature of the person, rather the nature and the person of God demands that we worship him as he has prescribed. You want to know what, what does it mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? You want to know what that means? It means that the nature and the person of God demands that we worship him as he has prescribed in his word. Let me make it make more sense. The Samaritans, Jesus was talking to a Samaritan lady, they didn't have the scriptures. They didn't have the scriptures. Now for us, we take it for granted. We expect that everybody had access to the scriptures back then. No, they would go to the synagogue and listen to the scriptures being read. They didn't necessarily just have scriptures in their home, as far as I know anyway. So not everybody just had a copy of the Bible or a copy of the Hebrew Bible with them in their houses. Not everybody had that. Maybe they would have had the Torah, okay, or the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. But not everybody would have necessarily had all of the Old Testament. They go to the temple to go and listen, or to the synagogue to go and listen to the scriptures and hear it be read out. The Samaritans especially, though, had no access to the scriptures. No access. Remember, our Jews didn't get along with Samaritans. No access to the scriptures. So guess what? They lacked truth. They have no access to the scriptures. How are they meant to worship God? How does God want to be worshipped? I don't know. We'll just try and worship him however we know how. So they're worshipping God, but not in truth. They're worshipping God, but not in truth. The Jews, however, had access to the scriptures. Their problem was they were worshipping God in truth, but not in the spirit. Is this making sense? They were worshipping God in truth, but not in spirit. What does it mean to worship God in spirit? It basically means that it's not down, is what I've been saying. It's not down to where do we go to worship God. Oh, we have to go to church before we can pray. We have to go to church before we can read our Bible. No, 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 no. God is spirit. He's invisible. He is omnipresent. God wants those who will not be bound by mere physical regulations, who will not be limited by mere physical regulations, but will worship him from the heart. Not just from the heart, however they please. That's where the truth comes in. They'll worship him from the heart according to how he has prescribed his worship. Remember we've said before, Romans 12, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, that there are acceptable forms of worship and unacceptable forms of worship. Okay? So, to relate to God properly and acceptably, you must know him properly. And you know him properly by knowing the truth that he has revealed of himself. And Jesus Christ is that truth. Is this making sense to somebody? I've asked you that question a million times. But I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure. Now, what can we learn about God? And I'm going to try and whiz through this in the last few minutes. One, 
from what we have to see in scripture, there's going to be a lot of things, a lot of things to learn about God, by the way. So I'm just going to try and go as quick as I can. And I won't cover everything, but I hope it makes sense. One, he is the only uncreated being. He is the only uncreated being. He is supreme. Let's just extol him for a moment. He is supreme in authority, supreme in majesty, power, splendor, love, wisdom, and glory. Everyone say glory. Everyone say glorious. Come on, say it like it's actually glorious. Say glorious. He is supreme in glory. That's what I love about God. He is amazing. There is nobody higher than him. That's why they call him the most high. Everyone speak in tongues for a second. Say El Elyon. That's Greek for God the most high. Or rather it's Hebrew, I think it is. Maybe it's Greek. Is it Hebrew or is it Greek? I think it's Hebrew. I can't remember. The most high. God the most high. There is none higher than him. There's nobody on his level. He was the first one to say, my yay is different to your yay. Is this making sense? That's God. He is the definer of all things. He is holy. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3. Revelation chapter 4 verse 8. He is good. Mark chapter 10 verse 18. Luke chapter 18 verse 19. And he is love. 1 John chapter 2. I think that is rather chapter 4 verse 8. Everyone say holy, good, love. Anything that ascribes to or claims to be that must submit to God. Because he's the one that defines that which is holy, that which is good, and that which is loving. Okay? Now understand. Everyone say this. God is love, but love is not God. Whoa, Corday, are you just saying confusing things? Are you trying to sound super spiritual? This is what I mean. God is love. God defines what it means to love. God defines what it means to be loving. God defines love. But love is not God. Here's what that means. Your idea of love, your culture's idea of love, your parents' idea of love does not define God. Because what you'll find is that the way God has defined love will clash with the way culture has defined love. That's what I mean by God is love, but love, your perception of it, your ideology of love is not God. If it is not defined by God, whatever you call love is not love. Is this making sense? God is love, but love is not God. He is the only God. If you want to see God's just, you know, I don't want to say boast because God is humble in it. Do you get me? But if you want to see God just kind of talk about how amazing he is, read Isaiah chapter 45 and 46. He's like, there is no one beside me. Nobody's on my level. There was no one before me, and they're sure as heck, they're sure as me ain't going to be anybody after me. That's God. That's God. He is the only God. Why is it important to know that there was none before him, beside him, or after him? Because somebody called Joseph Smith claimed to have revelations. His followers are called the Mormons. And they believe that human beings partake in the divine nature, which is what scripture says, but now here's the aberration. And they, indeed they partake in the divine nature, and you can become gods too. And you'll now ask them, well, where did you get that? Well, the Bible says we can partake in divine nature, but obviously there are different interpretations of that. So Joseph Smith had revelations, and with his revelations, um, the book that he wrote, that, that's where you can get greater understanding in how human beings can become God. Everybody say no. no. Say it with some tenacity. Say no. no. Now say it lovingly. Say no. no. Some of you said it more gently. Gentle doesn't always mean loving, by the way. So we need to remember these basic truths about God. Because in the moment, people can try and corrupt scripture in your hearing. And try and make it mean what it doesn't mean. Alright? God is eternal. Exodus chapter 14. Everyone say Yahweh. Yahweh. Lastly, I have to end here. But I want to say so more. Everyone say the aseity of God. Say that. The aseity of God. Here's what that means. It basically means God needs nothing and he needs no one. God doesn't need you. Never has, never will. Now why am I saying it so, you know, aggressively? Because I get the impression, and maybe it's just me, but sometimes we see preachers who they intend to preach the love of God, which is really good. But they preach it as though God has need of us. God just, he needs you. You know, he, he just can't live without you. No, God was doing it for eternity and he can continue if he wants to. God doesn't need you. He never needed you. Never will. But I need you to understand something. God loves you. He wants you. Though he doesn't need you, he wants you. He's self-existent. He exists by himself. He is self-sustaining. 
He is self-sustaining. God is carbon neutral. Okay, maybe, maybe that's not, so okay. Maybe that's slightly heresy because God created the world, which includes carbon. But I think you understand the point I'm trying to say. God is self-sustaining. He doesn't need us. He doesn't. But he desires us. And he desires us not because of his need for us, but because of his own divine prerogative. God's want for you is not based on need. Wouldn't you argue that when somebody only wants you because they need you, that they don't love you as much as the person who wants you even though they don't need you? Wouldn't we argue that? That a love that's based on need maybe is not love at all. Maybe it's not love at all. And get this, he doesn't want us because of anything we've done, but because of his divine prerogative. Now, some of us don't like this, and I know my time is up, but I'm going to finish here. Some of us don't like the fact that God doesn't need us, but he wants us. Some of us don't like that. Some of us, that makes us uncomfortable. Why does it make us uncomfortable? It makes us uncomfortable because we want to be needed. We want to be needed. It's like when you're in a relationship and your girl tells you, guys, you know, I'm not going to lie, like, I don't really need you, but I actually want you. And you're kind of like, yeah, thanks, but... mm." Why does that make us uncomfortable? Maybe it makes us uncomfortable when it comes to God because we fear that if we're just wanted, that one day that want will stop. Maybe that's why it makes some of us uncomfortable that he doesn't need us, but he wants us. And guess what? When we know we're wanted, some of us will concede, you know what, at least, okay, I'm wanted, but at least want me because of the things I've done. Don't just want me for your own reasons. Want me because of the things I've done. Why do some of us want to earn God's desire? The reason that some of us want to earn God's desire is because it gives us a level of control. It gives us a level of power. If God's desire for me is based on what I've done, then that means that if I continue doing what I'm doing, he will never stop loving me. Yeah. And then God turns around and tells you, I don't love you based on anything you've done. And suddenly you feel uncomfortable because it's like we're insecure. We feel like if God doesn't want us based on anything he's done, we've, we've done rather, maybe that means that there's nothing we can do if God were to stop wanting us. Guys, 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 do you want to know what's at the heart of certain insecurities? Pride. That's pride, man. That's pride. It takes pride to, it takes humility rather, to accept and receive God's love. It takes humility. You mean to tell me, God, you love me, and it's not based on anything I've done? There's nothing I can do to earn your love? There's nothing I can do really to get rid of it? Quote and unquote. Hmm. Last thing I'll say is this. Some of us want to be needed because we only care about what we need. Some of us want to be needed because we only care about what we need. In other words... We only care about the people we need in our lives. The moment we don't need them, we stop caring about them. And we project that onto God. And we are afraid. We want to be needed by God because we feel that if he doesn't need us, he doesn't care about us. That's a warped version of love. It takes humility to accept and believe God's love. Please rise to your feet. When we notice this love of God that loves us, Before we were even friends of his, whilst we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love of God. When we say God is love, his love is from him. It is who he is. I want us to understand something. Like I said, may God give us the grace to be humble, to really accept and to know God's love. What should be our response to this love of God? Humility. It should cause us to marvel and say like David said in Psalm chapter 8, Who are man? Well, who is man? What is man that you care for him? The son of man. Why do you care for us? It should cause us to marvel. And here's what I want to say finally. You see, some people say, how could a loving God send somebody to hell? Do you want to understand that it is a loving God who sends people to hell? It's a loving God who sends people to hell. Not just to demonstrate love to the ones who have been offended by our sin. But also, because when we live our lives saying, God, I don't want you. God, I don't want you. What's that human saying that we sometimes say? If you love something, you will what? Let it go. So when God sends a person to hell, it's not because of hatred per se. I would say, that's God lovingly giving the person what they want. Please bow your heads. 
Lord, what we're asking is that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, work on our desires so that we, O oh God, appropriately respond to your love. Lord, give us the grace to grasp in whatever you have apportioned us to grasp. Give us the grace to grasp your love, to know how wide, how high, how deep, Lord, your love is for us. And not to despise your love, but to respond properly so that we can say we love God because he first loved us. Help us not to be disqualified on account of this word, Lord. And as we apply this word by loving you, by obeying your commands, we ask, oh God, that you would receive all the glory. We would receive the joy and we would inherit your glorious kingdom as it starts even now. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated.